you know, Pennsylvania Avenue in Baltimore City was part of the Chitlin Circuit. It was basically a series of cities that were part of the Black arts touring sites, right? So if you were a singer or if you had a theater piece that you wanted to be seen by African Americans in the United States, you would come to Pennsylvania Avenue in Baltimore, Maryland. You know, it was, it was flourishing. It was a thriving um, district. There were shops, there were restaurants, bars. And all black clubs. owned. Yeah. Yes. Hello, my name is Angela N. Carroll. I'm a writer and filmmaker based in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm excited to be in conversation with performance artist Ada Pinkston. Hello, my name is Ada Pinkston. I am a mixed media artist and my practice is unbound to media. I am a performance artist, a installation artist, and also an educator. And I create work to rewrite histor history, basically. I create work to reconsider the canon of history. And um, I'm excited to talk to Angela. Excellent. Uh, it is a chilly day, so I'm grateful. We are in a really beautiful facility, the ARC Social Club, which is one of the oldest uh, Black social clubs in the nation. Um, so it's beautiful, which, and it also exists on Pennsylvania Avenue in Baltimore, Maryland. And I'm really excited to be in conversation with you today about your latest film and research initiative, uh, which is called Pennsylvania Avenue, a Requiem for the Past, a Poem for the Present, which you created during the uh, 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I wanna begin by pulling from a quote from the beginning of the film in which you say, uh, the absence of memory is not there until you recognize that it is there. The story of the architecture and the place that you are surrounded by is often layered, mostly unknown, ignored or intentionally forgotten. When you move down the streets of Baltimore, you see the structures and bones of what once was. The violence of racial capitalism has made Baltimore what it is today. So for those that are not familiar with Baltimore City and what you may mean by racial capitalism and the violence of that, can you share a little bit about what that is as it relates to the region and also you know, specifically why you chose to focus your current research on um, the histories of Black memory in Baltimore City? When I said racial capitalism in that section of the video, I was specifically thinking about the long history of the extraction of wealth from people of color across the world. And this, this term was started in a book written by Cedric Robinson in the 80s. And the book was called Black Marxism. And basically, you know, the theory and also the praxis is that in order for extreme wealth accumulation to happen, the resources of people is, has been extracted, right? So if we look at that in the context of Baltimore City, for instance, um, Sandtown Winchester is literally right next to Bolton Hill. And these are neighborhoods in Baltimore City that have extreme disparities in wealth and um, and in terms of, and you can see that in the ways that the architecture um, looks according to which neighborhood has uh, people with extreme wealth versus the neighborhood that does not. And this has been systemically um, enacted by a series of, of systems that make it so. So for instance, we can look at redlining as an example um, for that, for the reason why these extremes exist in Baltimore City. And when I say redlining, that is a term that was used and started in like the 50s, 60s, and it basically rendered black neighborhoods um, 
less valuable than white neighborhoods. And it wasn't just in Baltimore, it's across the United States. Um, but this, this rendering of, of black property as less valued made, um, made it so that it was just another barrier for, for black wealth accumulation. And again, you see that specifically in the, the architecture of, um, of a lot of black neighborhoods. But so this, this performance video started um, with the question of the green book. So let me take it back. So in 2017, I started this project, this series about Confederate monuments. And it started off with a question of, okay, so we have, so currently there's over 1000 Confederate monuments in the United States. And it made me think when I thought about that, it made me think about, okay, so there's a thousand monuments to the Confederacy in the United States, when were they, when were they built, right? Like when were they established? And the majority of them were established at the height of, or built at the height of Jim Crow, which was simultaneously when the Green Book was, was published. So, there is this, it's an interesting juxtaposition between um, what was erected, right? Like how, how do these markers of white supremacist value exist currently today, but also when were they erected? And then also what were the sites of resistance that happened at the same time, right? So I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm kind of circling around but it, it's one of those things where you have to circle around because it is, I'm, I'm literally just trying to get to the bottom of what does it look like to rewrite, our, rewrite the canon or to uplift the canon outside of the centering of this white history, right? So I started this project in 2017 when I was visiting my grandmother and my parents are from Mississippi and I was literally in a town where most of the infrastructure is crumbling, falling apart, except the Confederate statues are pristine and uh, well kept. And, you know, so again, this juxtaposition between what is considered to be valuable and what is considered to be worth upkeeping is something that made me start this project, right? Or start the, the beginning of this research. But, um, but then, so fast forward a year later, there was a, a series of Confederate monuments that were being removed across the country. And I literally was like, okay, so these Confederate monuments have our spaces where there's, you know, they're empty spaces, right? Um, but now that there are these empty spaces, what do we do with them? And how do we fill those spaces with uh, a counter narrative? And how do we make our stories, or how do we create a space for, for our stories to be um, told and preserved? But I started with the green book. So this is such a nebulous, so concept, right? So like I'm a very concept oriented artist and I felt like the green book was a way to ground those series of questions and thoughts. Um, and it's also interesting to think of, or to even see, right? Like, so if you look at the green book, so it was published four times. Um, and can you share a little bit about, for those who are not familiar with what the green book is, or why it was created. Can you share a little bit about what that publication is, was, why it was significant for black folks in America and why it was an important reference for you for the project? So the Green Book was written by Victor H. Green and it was published in 1938, 1947, 1954, and 1963. And basically Victor H. Green was from Harlem and he literally started the book at the height of Jim Crow when 
Black people in the U.S. could not really move freely, even though the institution of slavery was over, um, there were systems of, or a series of laws that were put in place that made it so that we couldn't move freely. And this book has, uh, it's basically uh, markers. It's a series of, of, it's a list of restaurants, um, hotels, guest houses, um, places for black people to stay throughout the United States if they were traveling um, to stay and be safe, right? Because, you know, Jim Crow era was also a moment where there were, it was the height of lynching. And um, there was always this constant threat of violence that was state sanctioned because of the Jim Crow laws that were in place. As you look through the pages of the book, it's interesting to see, okay, so you know, so I just turned to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Hotel Everready, 1325 Government Street, right? Now, if I were to go to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to see if the Everready Hotel on 1325 Government Street is still there, um, that's what, I mean, that's what this project is about, right? Like seeing what is oftentimes these businesses and establishments aren't there. Um, and it's, uh, it's often, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what has been preserved, what hasn't been preserved, and looking at the contradictions between what has and hasn't been preserved specifically in cities and towns that have Confederate monuments. And I think um, what's most compelling about the project and why we're here today on Pennsylvania Avenue is that the Green Book references so many important Black landmarks, hotels, jazz venues that were on Pennsylvania Avenue or what used to be known as the Avenue, which is uh, a predominantly Black region of Baltimore City, which again is a predominantly black city, one of the last majority black cities in the country. Um, and in your research, you looked at many of these venues that uh, there were maybe 11 or 12 venues that the Green Book lists that were noted in, in Pennsylvania, on Pennsylvania Avenue. And what was so startling about your research is that none of them exist. And very few of them have even any any architectural residue, any marquees or any uh, landmarks to show that they ever existed at all. So in many ways, the Green Book is the lasting archive or record that, that shows that black, black history does exist in this region um, where otherwise, other than archival images or photographs, that, that history has been erased in, in, the, in the actual architecture and the landscape of the city. Can you talk about uh, your research in Pennsylvania Avenue and the significance of the sites in the region and the significance of you finding that, again, many of those spaces no longer exist? Yeah. I used to work at Jubilee Arts, which is a space on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's a community art center, um, but it is also a church. Basically, there's dance, visual arts, sculpture, programming, for young people from seven to 12. And then they also have a young adult program um, facilitating arts and entrepreneur skills with um, people in the neighborhood. So it's a multifaceted community center that was started by Elder Harris, who was born and raised in Sandtown. So I, I was working there in 2012 and you know, Jubilee Arts is one of the only spaces. I mean, there's Jubilee Arts, there's Shake and Bake, there's um, the boxing space, Umar Boxing Ring. Um, but these are a select few of the spaces that are still actively um, running programming for the community, right? Um, but when Elder Harris was a younger person, um, he grew up here and saw the vibrancy of Pennsylvania Avenue in the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, Pennsylvania Avenue in Baltimore City was part of the Chitlin Circuit. And the Chitlin Circuit was a, um, it was basically a series of cities 
that um, were part of the black arts touring um, sites, right? So if you had, if you were a singer or if you had a theater piece that you wanted um, to be seen by African-Americans in the United States, you would come to Pennsylvania Avenue in Baltimore, Maryland. So, or you would go to 125th Street in Harlem, New York. Um, so yeah, so the Pennsylvania Avenue um, circuit or the Pennsylvania Avenue um, vibrancy was something that was once, you know, it was, it was flourishing. It was, it was, um, it was a thriving um, district. There were shops, there were, you know, restaurants, all, yeah. Bars and all black clubs. owned. Yeah. Yes. And I think it's important to, you know, for the context, again, this is segregated America, mm -hmm. right? So Jim Crow South in uh, Jim Crow North, right? Meaning that uh, black communities in America are segregated from white communities in America. And so black communities are creating businesses, are creating communities um, for entertainment, for food, for all of our needs, completely separate from. Um, white communities, because that was the law, that was a legislated mandate. So when you're talking about this Chitlin circuit and you're talking about these, these points or these sites across the country that serve as the primary arts and entertainment um, spaces for black communities, um, I just wanted to be understood that these are the only sites, right, um, that are kind of mandated in these cities where black people can gather safely. Yeah, exactly. Um, it is interesting as you say this because I have close friends and family members that think, and understandably so, and have the perspective that once integration happened, it kind of deteriorated the black community in, in ways that, um, I mean, we see the material uh, uh, consequences of what happened. Um, post the Civil Rights Act in 1965. You know, this neighborhood had black people of many different classes living together, right? You could, a doctor could live next door to a welder, could live next door to a plumber, could live next door to a, um, a janitor or, an, uh, um, you know, or a maid even, right? But then when integration happened, the people from higher classes in the black community moved out of black neighborhoods. And that was one that was one marker of the reason why um, a lot of our black business districts kind of started to crumble, right? Um, then again, there's the system of redlining, right? That caused um, black businesses to fall apart. I mean, there's also, you know, this question of ownership versus renting, right? Um, for instance, I have a friend whose mother had a business on Howard in the 70s and she told me 70s and 80s, right? And she told me all of a sudden the the landlord tripled the rent, the landlords and Howard tripled the rent at the same time, so no one could afford those rents. And now, I mean, you know, it started, it's, it's an ebb and flow type of situation, but at one point, all of the people that were renting and, and had businesses had to move out because they couldn't afford the rent anymore, right? Um, and that's what I mean, again, when I say racial capitalism, right? It's like these specific systemic um, reasons to, extract and um, or reasons, but also practices of extraction um, to maintain or to, con to continue to accumulate capital in one, one side, on one side of the, of the line, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important yeah. distinction because what it does is it clarifies what for some people may just say, oh, well, black people are poor. Right. And so when we think about sorts of like international 
equivalencies of sort of like Black American experience based on, you know, maybe media or films from like the 90s and earlier, right? Um, the presumption was, and still is for the most part, that the vast majority of Black Americans live in poverty. And that that poverty is somehow solely our fault, right? Um, that it's not any sort of um, systemic issue, that it's not legislation, that it's not govern in, government and state um, disinvestment, that it is solely the fault of the people. And so what, what the very important aspect of your research kind of reveals, right, is, is um, and I think that there are lots of texts that speak to this as well, Color Lines, was a really great text that speaks to this as well. But what your research reveals is that, again, this is, these, this is generations and decades and decades of state and federally legislated um, actions and that slowly uh, dismantled Black thriving, what were once thriving and prosperous um, black communities in entertainment districts and neighborhoods, you know, so any blight that exists in the present is, was, is a choice that the cities and states made to intentionally disinvest from black communities in that region. And there's something very disturbing about that proof. And, um, and that's a point that your research uncovers in a really in a really eloquent, in a really eloquent way. Can you speak a little bit about the specific sites on Pennsylvania Avenue that your research covers and, um, and maybe any surprising research that you uncovered about those sites? Yeah, so specifically, I was really guided by the story of Ruby Glover, who was a singer. She was born in 1934. She taught at Sir George College when it was still accredited and still a, an institution. Um, and she literally went, she would literally described her experience as a performer on Pennsylvania Avenue when she was like a young person, right? And she talks about casino. She talks about the Sphinx Club, uh, the Royal Theater. She talks about... Um, uh, Gambinos too, which is another one. Um, but the one that struck me the most was the Sphinx because that one stayed open until 1988. And it was owned, it was a members only club similar to the club that we're sitting in now, right? So we're in the Arch Social Club, which is literally one of the, actually the only establishment that is still open um, along Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, it's a members only club and, um, it originally was established as a, as a, a men's house, right? A gentleman's club, but now it's open to everyone. But, um, but the Sphinx club was a members only club as well. Mostly performers like it was a space for other artists to go it was like the after after party spot right and um it was you know considered like the upper echelon of the black community would come in so you would have like politicians and like i said like the this you know local celebrities or like uh um comedians you know very famous black community comedians from you know from all over singers um, dancers, right? So, but when Charles Tillman died in 88, um, the space had struggles, right? Um, cause in 88, we're talking about, this was at the height of, or towards, yeah, at the height of the drug epidemic, right? That, uh, is also state sanctioned. And, um, you know, so he died and, the person that was it was passed off to had a hard time um, keeping the doors open. And so it closed down in 92. And now what's left is it's, I think, next door is the liquor store. Um, you still see the bones of the structure, but it's no longer, it's no longer there. But yeah, that story was interesting to me because it literally 
died with the person that opened the doors, right? Which says a lot, right? So it was clearly a labor of love on his part to keep it open. Um, but, you know, in 88, Pennsylvania Avenue was no longer a part of this, of the Chitlin Circuit, right? Like there was no need for Chitlin Circuit anymore, right? Although it's still, these types of spaces still do exist, right? I mean, you know, you look at the way Tyler Perry uh, plays started, right? Like that's how he started his career. Mm -hmm. um, Touring black communities. Yeah. Touring black neighborhoods. Yeah. yeah. And it's significant to think about the artists that came to these venues, because some people, again, who are not familiar will say, okay, well, it's a, it's a club. What's the significance of a club? But Billie Holiday, you know, sang at these clubs. Cab Calloway mm -hmm. sang at these clubs. Um, Muhammad Ali, right? Um, these are spaces where these were the only venues where Black artists were allowed to play uh, because, again, of segregation. So these spaces really should be national landmarks, um, but they've been allowed to, to fall into dilapidation, to mm -hmm. fall into decay. And so in many ways, that speaks to or asks a question about why is Black memory or why are Black landmarks seen as less valuable than, than white landmarks? Why are, why are spaces that repositories of Black memory not valued, not, um, not archived, not uh, maintained, not sustained in the same way that other, that other spaces are? You know what? I honestly want to take it back to racial capitalism, right? Because in order, because I mean, you know, so the, the, the beginning of this practice started with colonialism, right? And in order for colonial structures to maintain power or colonial entities to maintain power, you have to take away the autonomy or take away the cultural, um, strength of, of the communities that are being oppressed, right? Or dispossessed, right? So for instance, um, we can, I mean, I could I see the connection between stealing sculptural forms from ancient, um, ancient societies in West and North and all over the world. I was going to say Western North Africa, but all over the world, right? I can see the connection between stealing um, sculptural forms and artwork uh, from indigenous societies across the world and putting them in museums. I see that, I see a direct line between that to not um, maintaining the cultural legacies of African American history and culture and you know it's the same so that line there's a direct through line but it's also again like the con it's, it's a demonstration of the contradictions of this country but also the contradictions of the world right so can you speak more to that um uh as far as clarifying that through line in relation to if some aspects of african culture are deemed worthy of of being archived and other aspects of African-American culture are deemed unworthy of being archived. Mm -hmm. what, you know, what is that? And why is that, are you, that, that, you're, that you're arguing or kind of thinking through? I think, honestly, I think it's about, um, I think it literally is about ownership and ownership of a narrative, right? And, and controlling a narrative because it, because it makes, it will, it would make the argument of our present day situation less easy to, um, so the argument of our present day situation in the context of the U.S., right? It would make it more complicated or make it more difficult to to say, oh, well, um, if you are a descendant of people that were enslaved in the U.S., um, your current circumstance and condition is your fault, right? Versus really looking at what was created, what 
what type of um, what types of of things were created out of nothing, right? Um, so it's it would just be it, it becomes it would make that story the the story of hegemony or the story that exists a little it would make it more difficult to to tell because <laughs> you know what I mean because of what we did create right in spite of in spite of all of that right mm -hmm. so um so yeah I think there's that piece and I also think that you know so I'm an educator right so a lot of the people that I teach um really think and you know it's it's this this story of the U.S. history of okay so um 1964 happened, the schools were integrated. Um, Martin Luther King came and, and said, I have a dream and his dream is fulfilled and now everyone is, is together, right? So that, that oversimplified story of history is something that makes it so that all of these establishments that are part of our history that really um you know what that showed that we created something out of nothing and um were able to survive and thrive within the context of this jim crow system um it doesn't it, it doesn't fit right it's like it's a right. it would be too mm -hmm. much of a contra contradiction right because mm -hmm. you can't um, be you can't be the lazy black stereotype right. and be an innovator of all of this brilliance in the face of, and again, in spite of all of the violence, all of the systemic, you know, that happens to you consistently daily, right? It, it breaks that narrative that it's your fault, right? Um, which I think is really interesting. Can you, can you, I think your visual essay, which is really beautiful as well, um, speaks to this question of, we are aware of the history of this blight. We are aware of what has created it and now we are asking the question around what revitalization means mm -hmm. because we want to secure black memories in the future. We want to, we know and see and are imagining black, black futures. And part of black futures is, is a repository for black memory. So what does it mean to revitalize the region? But again, as you said, speaking to this notion of racial capitalism, so much of revitalization projects are tied to gentrification um, or the revitalization only happens as a means through which to dislocate poorer or blacker communities that are in regions to make way for wealthier white communities. Mm -hmm. We see this in other cities that were used to be predominantly black or brown across the country. Um, those disparities are most stark in cities like Brooklyn, New York. Um, most stark in cities like Washington, D.C., most stark in cities like Detroit, where those revitalization efforts did, were not to the benefit of the communities that were previously there and actually further um, exacerbated the loss of Black memory and the loss of Black property in those spaces. So much of your research and much of what you articulate in the film is a complication of this moment, right? A desire to want to revitalize the region tethered to the, um, the history of what revitalization has meant for, for black spaces. So can you, can you talk a little bit about um, that component of it? Do you have, do you have hopes for um, revitalization that may happen in the region? And if so, how would one approach that in a way that is um, beneficial to the communities that are that are currently here. I mean, yes, I do have hopes, but I honestly am cautiously optimistic about the potential for revitalization here. So very recently, this region has been declared an arts and entertainment district. Pennsylvania Avenue with the communities of Upton, Druid Heights, and Penn North is now a state designated arts and entertainment district with an economic development plan to revitalize this long neglected and underserved area, which was once the place to be. And then there's this move to make this be a black arts and entertainment district. 
And again, I'm very optimistic about these things, right? Because I think that the the uh, intention is for it to center black ownership and um, create a space for this area to be thriving once again, right? Um, you know, I but I've seen firsthand. So, for instance, 125th Street is is an excellent example of that, right? Uh, 20 years ago, even. Mm, I was going to say even 10 years ago, but like 20 years ago for sure. And this uh, 125th Street in Harlem, in New Harlem, York. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So 125th Street in Harlem, New York. Right. So um, the Apollo was the one space that stayed throughout um, the blight of the region. Right. Um, but then there was very violent gentrification that happened. And now... You know, so a lot of the black owned businesses that were once there, you know, I'm talking about hair shops, uh, you know, like a, like the DTLR version of of the store of the shops over there that you would see in, uh, in New York. Right. Um, and these are kind of small kind of secondhand shops or spaces where you can get kind of cheap athletic leisure clothes. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. They are not really, you know, it's not really there anymore. Instead, you, you see the uh, all the chains, like the Starbucks, uh, whatever the national chains are. Right. And, and this, you know, a lot of the, the heart of the region is starting to slowly uh, fade away. Right. Um, you see a lot of white people. Right. Um, and I remember as a kid, like when I was a teenager, actually, the tour buses, right? You saw the tour buses of the Europeans going around looking at the historic uh, black neighborhood in New York, right? And that, it, you know, becomes, it's like, okay, so we are like, it's like a zoo, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or is it like what we are being watched in our natural habitat like what is what exactly is this right so again like i i'm a bit concerned about what what it would look like here right like how how to make make sure and um how to make sure and that our stories do not get co-opted and how to make sure that our stories um, do not become a spectacle that is that could that could be a, a, a power dynamic that is uncomfortable to exist in, right? Um, but I mean, there's organizations. So, Black Women Build is an exa- excellent example of an organization that is doing the work to make sure that. Um, revitalization happens within the context of, of um, you know, of black ownership, right? Um, yeah, fight, you know, fight blight is another example. Um, uh, Nika Namandi. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, of, of an organization that is making sure that revitalization happens with the maintenance of, of autonomy, right? Um, so yeah, I hope I hope it goes continues down that direction. Mm-hmm. You know, and do you see this work as being finished? I mean, I think this is sort of a portal in and of itself, right? When you talk about, you can't just talk about uh, the history of of Black America without again talking about the history of the oppression of Black America. You can't talk about the history of oppression of Black America without thinking about and looking at the specific legislations and the specific actions that perpetually disenfranchised. Black America, and because it's because it is so nuanced, and because it is so interlaced into um, what Isabella Wilkerson has articulated so beautifully in uh, Cast, right? It is tied to this notion, this false hierarchy, mm-hmm. that Black Americans are less than, and somehow less valuable than, less human than, than White Americans, and so I can imagine that this research could go on for years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious for you about how this, how your research will 
iterate into different um, artworks and or performative works for you other than the short film uh, visual essay that you've done specifically about Pennsylvania Avenue? Yeah, so I have a, a plan. <laughs> I have the vision to do site-specific performances at various sites, um, specifically in response to, but also um, in a generation of things. How do we generate the story of Black woman, right? Um, but also like Black history outside of the context of, of these Confederate legacies. Um, but yeah, so it's, a, it's an iterative process. I'm always creating site-specific works. Um, and it's also, honestly, it's very grounded in spirit work, you know? So when I was in Montreal, I discovered work around, or I discovered this woman, her name is um, Marie-Joseph Angelique who literally um, burned down the city of old Montreal in an attempt to escape slavery in the 18th century. Um, currently, I'm doing another iteration of this work um, that's gonna be an augmented reality monument for Biddy Mason, who was one of the, the people that established Los Angeles, African-American woman, um, she was enslaved and she walked from the state of Mississippi all the way to Los Angeles um, in a caravan with the people that enslaved her. But she also was a healer and a midwife. And she used her skills to uh, purchase land, plots of land um, at a time when a lot of, you know, when women didn't have a lot of uh, agency or autonomy, but definitely not black women. But um, to answer your question, I do see this as an iterative, it's a, this is an iterative process. Um, and honestly, these women come to me from spirit work, but, um, but also I'm very, I'm very interested in thinking as a performer, right? Like what is the, how do we, how is my relationship to performance informed by the relationship of um, other performers, right? That have been on this stage or that have been on um, other stages that were thriving, <laughs> you know, at one point with only black audiences, right? Or, you know, and this is something that I think about oftentimes we were talking, like I'm often thinking about like, what, what is this dy dynamic between myself as performer and the audience? And what does it mean to break that wall? Um, and how do I put, how do I bring people on this journey <laughs> um, with me, right? And it's, um, you know, so yes, it is, it, it is life's work. Um, and it's ongoing and it's iterative, um, but it's also, it's something, you know, and it's, it's feeding, it's, it's very, it's nourishing to do this work too. Um, yeah. You talked a little bit about how these women who you kind of, it seems you orient your research from these women that come to you and then that research sort of expands into larger questions. Can you talk a little bit about your process? Um, how, what draws you to a particular theme or topic that then goes into research that then turns into a performative or moving image work? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, oftentimes my process starts with one question <laughs> and then, or one a thesis or, or theory, and then through the process, it turns into something completely different. But it's usually starts with, okay, like what is the story of black people here? It then it becomes like narrow down, narrow down, narrow down until I find a person or a story that hasn't been told. And 
then in that way, I'm like, okay, well, what, what would it look like if I do make a visual canon around this story? And so I use a lot of digital media in my work. We are in such a technology-centered world. Um, and digital media is a way to kind of put the image out quickly. Um, and it, it's a way to get, to tell the story um, without a lot of funding as well, right? So in 2017, I, I'd collaborated with a bunch of folks to make a, a monument for people who were victims of state-sanctioned violence, right? And that was just a projection. It was a three-channel projection, right? Projection mapping. So the process is is varied, but it's it's grounded in what are the what are the moments. What are the things that are unsaid? What are the things that are unsayable? And how do we make those things more loud? In your, in your essay, you talk about uh, progressive Black convening spaces, right? And, and sort of what the loss of those spaces in Black cities across the country has meant to the loss of Black memory with the COVID-19 pandemic, many of us have had to think about and reimagine how to connect with each other, um, how to stay connected, right? Um, when we cannot be in physical proximity to each other. I'm curious about your thoughts and or hopes for the future or the ways that we may be reimagining Black convening spaces in the, fu in the future again, towards the sustainability um, of, of Black memory? You know, honestly, I'm, I'm a huge believer of outside spaces. Like how do we center, recenter nature or our connection with nature? Um, and I think that with that, because you know, the, the technologies of nature are pretty advanced, right? Like even when we think about the trees, they're all connected with each other underground, right? Like the roots are connected. So I, I see that, I see that as a, as a future, you know? Cause I, I mean, you know, these, all this technology can easily be co-opted again. We were talking about all these, these apps, like we can look at Facebook, uh, basically owning all of our all of the means for our communication, right? So then, if that if that is the case, then what what is real? What what does communication? What does autonomous communication look like if not through like being connected through the, the mushrooms of you know underground, right? Well, thank you for being in conversation with me. Um, your project is so important. And I look forward to seeing how your work continues to evolve in the future. Oh, thank you. Thank you for facilitating this conversation and creating a holding space for it.